This one time in China, Greg and I found ourselves lost in a thick forest with no clear way out. We were in the Bamboo Sea in southwestern Sichuan province. It's a beautiful destination. We were drawn to it after having seen Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon, which features seemingly weightless kung fu warriors battling across the canopy far above our heads. The park authorities in China did a stellar job at countering the density of bamboo by laying a network of wide trails. And it only poses some level of confusion when two morons venture off said trail. After a few hours of, didn't we see this clump of trees before? We ran into a most unlikely group of helpers. Matsutake mushrooms are big business in East Asia, to the tune of hundreds of millions of USD per year. So naturally, we met a gang of armed mushroom poachers. These fellas, strolling with purpose around the forest wielding machetes, were hunting for this white gold. We calculated an equal chance of them feeling like cornered wolverines or correctly identifying us as American idiots. Now, I've always said that my Chinese is good enough to get us into trouble, but may not always be good enough to get us out. This time, friends, I was like a damned poet, and the hospitable thieves lowered their blades and escorted us to the road. That night, in their honor, we dropped some major coin on delicious matsutake soup. My name is Howie Southworth. I travel, I eat, I cook, and then I write fancy words about all of it. My cookbooks are loaded with wild stories and fabulous bites, and I've shared plenty of my own adventures. But now, I want to hear somebody else's for a change. Sauced in Translation is a timely podcast spanning the globe of food, spinning tales of lavish meals and epic gastronomic failure. Join us for some well-deserved armchair globetrotting. Let's get saucy. My guest today is Alex Dent. Alex is a professor of anthropology at the George Washington University in D.C. He is a celebrated teacher and researcher who's taken deep dives into intriguing topics like violent response to digital piracy and Brazilian rodeos as a physical manifestation of country music. As it happens, Alex takes the resulting related energies and pours them into being a vocalist and guitarist for the D.C. punk band Weird Babies. Alex and I are brothers in culinaria. As the unrelated person with whom I've eaten and cooked the most since our kids met in daycare 13 years ago, Alex has fed my kitchen alchemy as much as I've fed his. Being a decades-deep non-meat eater, Alex has served as my vegetable protein guru as well. Recently, we blended my obsession with Brazilian feijoada, that famous bean sausage stew, and his obsession with everything Brazil, his second home. We arguably created the world's first acceptable vegetarian feijoada. Here's our chat. Didn't we officially meet because our kids tried to break out of daycare together? I think that's right. So here's, so here's what happened because Cooper is six months older than Nico. That's he my got son. promoted yeah. to Cooper. the Todd. Yes. So he got promoted and Nico's my son. And so he got pro- Cooper got promoted to the toddler room. And Nico busted out a couple of times to go visit, but they had, they had worked it all out together. They'd worked out the details. They were like, okay, you're going to press the gate here. You're going to walk through the kitchen. There's a gate on the other side. Be ready for that. You got to press that gate there. And then we're home free and we'll hang out. You know, that's basically the upshot is that they, they had premeditated the gate openings and closings and figured out, you know, all right, after lunch, when she's sterilizing the bottles, she won't be noticing. I mean, they, they figured it out. Let me ask you this question. What would your Brazilian friends think of our fake feijoada, or as I call it, feijoada? I think they'd eat it. But, you know, the, the challenging thing, and I think they would like it, but I think they would maybe think that, you know, okay, this is good, but it's a different thing. And, you know, the reason, and you know, I've talked about this before, but the, but the crazy thing about feijoada is just the quantity of meat parts that get thrown in there while the beans boil. And so you leave that thing on the stove um, after you've cooked it and you could stand the spoon up in it when it cools down. I mean, there is so much fat and you can really taste that fat. And so ours, while it had the good, you know, the sausagey flavor, it didn't have that same like smack in the mouth fat feel that you get from, you know, boiling ears and other stuff in the, in the beans. So I think they'd notice, but I think they'd still like it. 
I was convinced, and maybe I'm slightly off on this, and you cannot replicate the mouthfeel of, of animal fat. However, I think that the canning liquid, particularly with chickpeas and black beans, I've noticed, does a lot toward that same texture, does it not? I think so. And I think for that, I think when we did that feijoada, we were really careful not to drain the beans because sometimes I drain the beans and I rinse them out. Or for that, you know, for that reason, I will like steal the the liquid from the beans and put them in the freezer. My freezer is filled with a, you know, a ton of tiny little Tupperwares filled with different colored bean juices, which I will <laughs> later use in vegan cookies or whatever. Um, so I think the short answer to your question is yes that that sort of proteiny, gluey slop that you get from cooking beans for a long period of time creates something like it. And then I think there's other things, you know, we've, we've talked about and, and you've, I think, accomplished really successfully with compacting like mushroom flavors together because mushrooms have that chewy, you know, meaty kind of thing going on. Man, I had some amazing portobellos the other night. Kai, Kai and I went to this, my wife Kai, we went to this uh, steak place here in DC, which was, you know, otherwise solid, but not paradigm altering called medium rare. And they did a marinated grilled portobello that I was like, well, I could be eating steak now. This is delicious. But anyway, mushrooms, I think you can get some of that kind of, you know, umami feel from from mushrooms soy sauce is another thing that kind of helps yeah and the, and the holy trinity the third one that i have been adding in the last couple of years is uh, sun-dried tomatoes which i feel also replicates some go-to texture of bacon in dishes i made oh, i made a vegan version of uh red beans and rice that mm. i i would swear that i could give this to a meat eater and have no comment it was delicious texturally right on and with a little bit of liquid smoke just spot perfect and you kind of finely chop the sun-dried tomatoes a little bit it uh, depends on what what i'm looking for in the dish but i think that that is the one thing that i would probably add to the uh, our faux joada uh, totally if, if we do as that you're again. talking about it i'm realizing that would totally that would take it to the next level i have to say as you talk about bacon I've been thinking about, I don't know why, I don't know what it is about this sort of late COVID times, but I've been thinking about the BLT a lot recently. So once upon a time, I used to make vegetarian BLTs for myself by deep frying smoked dulse, which is this seaweed, right? And you throw it in the pan and it crackles and it's pretty good and it's smoked. So like, that's a pretty good flavor and that works. But I've also been thinking about two things. So you have eaten on many occasions my kale chips, and it turns into this kind of semi-blackened crispy thing, which falls apart. So I've been thinking that that actually might make a good BLT, only possibly improved by fried cheese. Ooh. I think you could thinly fry a layer of like cheddar cheese. Cause you know, my younger son Sloan has been frying cheese for lunch and you get this thin, crispy piece. Like a twill. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the, the baking of like Parmesan twills has been a thing for a while. And I think oh, really? that, I think that, that that's the wrong thing because those are crunchy. That's not what you're looking for because what you're looking for is that slightly chewy, the cheddar, that, that, that's a great idea. And just that's take it out. Idea. It's, you know, I, think the, I think the technique there would be figuring out when to take the cheddar out so that it remained a little chewy and not just like totally, cr because that's the problem with the kale thing is that it totally, it falls into a million crumbles. They're delicious, salty, oily crumbles, which is what you want. But um, I'm going to try that out. I and mean, when, when tomato season comes back, I want to do a good BLT and I might use both. Gild the lily. So now that you've broken the seal and I had promised myself that I wasn't yet again going to ask somebody about their COVID eating habits, but you broke it. So I'm going to go there. Uh, you and I, uh, the other unique thing that we've shared is that uh, we've sort of been bubbled together as families throughout this, this whole thing. But I'm not sure I ever asked you specifically, what's been the biggest change in your family's eating habits since all this COVID hell broke loose? Right after we really settled into COVID and we were like, oh man, this is serious. Like this is not recreation. That first week in March, we were like, huh, better hunker down. And then we we're like, oh goodness, like this is, this is serious business. Kai, bless her, would not allow any food in the house that we had not cooked for three months. 
So we ate exclusively Dent Tiernan cuisine for three months. What did that mean? That meant the things we often do, takeout only, we had to get good at. So we had to get good at sushi and we had to get good at pizza. Those were the two, and those were two big challenges, right? Because as you know, better than I, those are not easy things to accomplish. It's not that they're spectacularly complicated, but like there's miniature techniques associated with each of them that you got to nail or everything tastes crappy. Like if you don't get the flavor of the rice right for your sushi, it's just going to be bad or the temperature or the texture, like the rice has got to be nailed. The other challenge for the sushi was finding a place that I felt safe going to where I could get a piece of sushi grade salmon because my, my older son, Nico, loves salmon. That's all he eats. My younger son wants avocado rolls. He's simple. Nico wants salmon. Kai and I want like, you know, a little bit of omelet in there or some pickled carrot or gomai style spinach in there that's been seasoned. So we're mainly vegetable folks, but Nico wants salmon. Anyway, I found a place down on U Street that everyone probably knows where I got my sushi grade salmon. You're talking up. about the you're talking about the Hana market. It's such a cool place. I feel like it's almost left over from a previous era. I hope to God they don't get pushed out by gentrification because you know it's this little market. It's crammed with stuff. Some of the snacks are candy, right? Like it's conceptually interesting, but I'm not going there for that. I'm going there because I want black soy sauce or I want, you know, a particular kind of fermented tofu or I want sushi grade salmon, um, or I want, you know, a particular kind of nori that's toasted in a particular way. Like that's the stuff that I go there for. Um, and excellent I, fish. And great. And you know, this and the salmon, and it was just so beautiful. You could just tell when I got it out, it was like pristine. There was no, none of that extra fishy smell, you know, it just sliced thinly and beautifully. And Nico was in cloud nine. He was like, this is delicious. It took us a couple of rounds to get the rice right. You know, because that, you know, how much vinegar, how much sugar, how much salt, what's your temperature when you're mixing it in, how long do you let it sit, which of course the Japanese have developed as with all things to like an exquisite technique. That took a little time. Um, Kai was in charge of rolling because she's got, you know, meticulous hands uh, and we got our sushi game up. The other thing from COVID eating has been pizza, which, you know, you and I have cooked together since. That was a big study too, like to use a stone to not use a stone, to use whole wheat in your flour, because I just objectively like the taste of whole wheat better. How much whole wheat to use? How long on the rise? What's the proportion of toppings to dough? All this stuff, which, you know, a pizza place just has down. And, you know, we have the good fortune, you and in, in, in um, Alexandria being close to Red Rocks. We have a Red Rocks close to us. We also have a timber pizza close to us, which is fantastic. So we've got good pizza close by, but Kai was like, nope nothing coming into the house. So we got our pizza game down to a, to a pretty fine study too. So those were, those were kind of the big things. Other than that, you know, we were doing our tacos and our stir fries. I do a lot of breading of chicken to put in the air fryer, air fryer, crucial tool in our kitchen have, as we have discussed. Oh, we've discussed at length as well as the instant pot. Got to have the instant pot. And just this weekend, you know, Passover, we made brisket. And, you know, what would have been a three and a half hour cooking process was a 75 minute cooking process for this brisket. Here's where you here's where you lose out, though. And I, I thought about this. and You and I have talked about this, that the Instant Pot is a fantastic time saver. And I totally agree. At the same time, part of the reason you're making that brisket is so that your house smells like that all day long. Right. And so that's when I toss it in the Dutch oven. But I do get it. As an efficiency tool, fantastic. It does make your house not smell as good. You know, that is very possibly true. But here's what I would say. That because of the convenience of the Instapot, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning. And you're like, well, let's throw the brisket on. And so you throw the brisket on, you cook the brisket, and the whole house smells like brisket. But you don't actually unplug the Instapot until you eat at dinner time. So the darn thing just sits there on the counter all day. And so, you know, I, it's, it's not as intense, but you can still get some of this kind of vestigial flavor circulating through the house because you just leave the darn Instapot on. Or you can pull your chair and your desk and your laptop right up to, to the uh, side of the Instant Pot there. Boom, Snuggle boom. up to it. We're moving on. If you can remember any travel before the Corona times, do you remember your latest trip and what you ate? Yes, I do remember it. And, you know, this is tied up with some sad history for me. So, you know, my father passed on February 29th of last year and I was in Toronto 
Um, it was just me, Kai and the boys stayed down here because of school, obviously. Um, although it's crazy for me to reflect back on that. That was the immediately pre-COVID times, right? Those were the moments when we were really figuring it out. So there are these two play, there are these two affiliated restaurants. One is called Taroni, and the other is called Sud C U D Forno. And the Sud Forno is just a walk-in, grab a slice of pizza. But Howie, the pizza, I mean, how to describe it? It's it's cut into rectangular pieces. It's kind of focaccia-esque. The dough is just spectacularly flavorful. But you know, when the dough is A, flavorful and crispy by itself, but also just an amazing conveyance for whatever is on it. And so, you know, sliced artichoke, grilled peppers, a sprinkling of rosemary, different strengths of cheese, tomato sauce, sometimes no tomato sauce. So Sudforno's pizza was amazing. And then they also do these incredible little teeny donuts. One are custard filled and one are kind of a Nutella filled. And it's <laughs> just, you know, you, it's they do a few things just unbelievably well. But Taroni is the accompanying a, Italian place. And they, I just had a spectacular grilled mushroom meal there. And so I was in this bizarre situation because I was spending the days at my father's hospital bed as I was pretty sure he was dying. You know, it was, it seemed pretty clear that, you know, these two things, his lungs and his heart were fighting with each other. And then, and I would get so stressed out. And at the end of the day, I would say to myself, okay, my dad's here. Should I stay or should I go and get a meal? And I would go, I'd be like, okay, this is self-care. I'm going to go, I'm going to get a really good meal. And then I'm going to come back. And I would just go, I would sit at the bar with my New Yorker and I would read to myself and I would get, I would get a good meal. And because of where I was in, in Toronto, it was amazing. The other thing I will mention on my last food trip is another one of those meals where I, you know, I'd been sitting with my dad all day and I went out to this, uh, to this brew pub. They had the most spectacular fried cod sandwich where, you know, everything was just perfect. Like the crispiness of the batter on the cod, the bun was perfect. They'd thrown a pickled radish, pickled uh, carrot kind of mixture on the top, just knocked it out of the park. But it had a crunchiness to it and a saltiness and an acidity, which just went so well with the kind of soft texture of the bun. I mean, man, they just nailed it. Uh, by the way, the, the brew probe was called Bellwoods Brewery. Uh, you've never made Canada sound more appealing. You know, I'll say this about the the juxtaposition of what was going on in your life while these meals were happening in between. In that context, it makes perfect sense that these meals stick out for better or worse uh, as some of the more memorable meals than the details therein. I, I find no surprise there at all. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's totally right. It was a way to try and take care of myself at this moment. And, you know, cause I could have just gone and gone to a subway and grabbed a sandwich and come straight back. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to be, and you know, some people listening to this might think it's selfish and that, and that and I get that. Like I just should have stayed the whole time and made the meals quick, or I could have gone down to the cafeteria, but I was like, you know what, I'm going to be able to be more present if I take care of myself and just come back and I'll be fresh and refreshed. And I think it worked, you know, I was able to kind of fall apart less, I think. Yeah, I think it's the healing power of food, man. I want you to try to recall your favorite travel food story. Do you got one of those? I do, absolutely, instantly. And this is Brazil. I went to live in Brazil in 1998, and then I went back for two years to do field work. I lived with a family in the city of Campinas, which is an hour and a half northwest of Sao Paulo. But I, I spent a lot of time in Sao Paulo. And Sao Paulo is an amazing, I mean, Sao Paulo has got plenty of problems, as does Washington, D.C., frankly, poverty and racism. It is, it happens to be a tremendous food city. And, you know, that is a reflection of these waves of immigration, you know, th this gigantic wave of Italian immigration in the 1920s and a little bit before as well, huge wave of Japanese immigration. Um, so the Italian food and the Japanese food are fantastic. Uh, the pizza is incredible. It's really, really good. It's different. It's often not tomato sauce based. It has stronger cheeses, uh, which was quite surprising to me when I got down there. And interestingly, I think there's kind of an interdiction against eating with your hands. So often you eat pizza with a knife and fork. It's civilized. Yeah, I guess. As do um, the Italians. Right, right, right. Yeah, good point. Certainly the Argentinians too, right? 
Um, you don't go picking your pizza up there. Yeah, but if you're in Argentina and you're trying to eat pizza, you're going to hurt yourself trying to eat an Argentinian pizza with your hands. Yeah, right, right. It's actually similar in Brazil, but although I think the Brazilian pizzas are closer to the Italian and sort of the thinness and crisp, you could pick a piece of this up, but no one does it. So great pizza, great, unbelievable sushi, great fish. You said I was vegetarian and that's true. I will eat fish from time to time. And that's an occasion in which I would eat some fish. So I had great pizza. I had great sushi there. I called you a non-meat eater. I didn't call you a vegetarian. That's fair. You did. The meal though, that I want to focus on is a meal that a friend of mine took me to this place. And you know, this is a, this is a, a trope in food stories, but it really was a hole in the wall. It was a house. It was a residential house perched on the edge of a hill in Sao Paulo. And it's this place called Casa Garibed. It's a Middle Eastern place. And, you know, everything tiled in this bright white tile, it feels almost antiseptic. You come into the entrance of the house and you come straight down a stairway into this kind of kitchen eating area. All, you know, tiles, simple wood tables and chairs, big brick oven at the back. And they make these little Middle Eastern pastries, which I had never had before. And I think they've become more popular in the United States since. You know, my, my take on Middle Eastern food was, you know, great hummus, great baba ganoush, but in Brazil, it's a lot of these little pastries and finger foods. Kibe, you know, is huge. These little colchões, these little chicken flavored shaped bells, which I didn't eat either of those two things. But the esfias, these little pastries were unbelievable. They were filled with different cheeses. They were filled with different herb uh, mixtures, you know, sort of zatara, but also other kind of green herbs with different seeds in them. The, you know, the hummus and the baba ganoush was amazing for dipping these things into. There was this great little thing of hot sauce at the table if you wanted to add fantastic pickled radishes. This was in your formative Brazil years. Yeah. You had that magic food moment where things just like turn you around. I mean, I've, I've told you a bazillion times about the things like I didn't know what to expect when we moved to Spain. And that was the entire reason that I enjoyed my Spanish experience so much because I had- Because z- you I didn't had, know. I had zero expectations. That's the coolest. But that childlike curiosity with which you approach that Middle Eastern place in a most weird location. It was random. If we ever go to Sao Paulo, we're going and it's still there, man. It is so good. So I can mispronounce the name of the city every time I say it. If you do Sao S-A-N, you're fine. They'll get it. But no, I, I want to say it right. I want to say Sao Sao. So- so, so, see, I can't. That's it. No, you just did. Oh, so, ho, ho, you just so, did it. So, That's it. That's this it. Is so, Paulo. Oh my gosh, that meal! I can just, I can see it so clearly. And I've been back there many times. And you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's in a part of the city which you would not go to. Nowhere near a tourist zone. So it's a, it's a decent cab ride. But you know, it's the same. You get in, you go into these people's home, basically down the stairs into this basement area, perched on the side of the hill, and these phenomenal pastries. And so of course the desserts were incredible too, because, you know, the baklava was amazing. And, and I, you know, I hadn't had Middle Eastern food probably for a year, which is a vegetarian staple. Although I would say, you know, in Brazil, they have a a Middle Eastern fast food place called Habib's, which is fine. You know, it's a fast food place, but it's fine. But this place is Esfia's. Oh man. I can just see through time thinking about the, the crispiness of the pastry, the very slight smoky flavor that is imparted by the wood, the layers of dough and the way they were folded differently and the different foldings makes for different absorptions of the flavor. Oh, you sprinkle a little lemon or lime juice on top of some of them. Mm. When uh, I think of a world cuisine, almost custom made for non-meat eaters, it's almost always Middle Eastern food or essentially the Levant. Um, I hate to say Middle Eastern food because I think that that's uh, uh, too broad of a description. It's what everybody understands, but essentially it's all Lebanese cuisine. Yes, I said it. Blame the Lebanese cooks. They were the geniuses. But nonetheless, when I think of vegetarian friendly world cuisines, that springs to mind uh, at the top of the list every time. But I believe that these waves of migration these early waves of Middle Eastern migration, I believe these were Lebanese folks, most of them. Uh, And I believe this restaurant was also a Lebanese owned uh, restaurant. So, And the other note I have is that I am flabbergasted at the lack of imagination when we think of eating hummus or baba ganoush or uh, muhammara, we think uh, toast points or pita toast or crackers, things like this. But my 
goodness. So if you spend any time uh, in that part of the world, you're taking the kibe, you're taking the pastries, you're taking the meatballs, you're taking the chickpea balls, you're taking the falafel, you're dipping it all into the dips. But if you've never had a falafel drowning in baba ganoush, you've not lived. Uh, the first morning after I arrived into Amman, Jordan, um, I went looking for where the locals were eating. And it was just about my personal soup Nazi moment where on Seinfeld, if you recall, the soup Nazi, the guy behind the counter was just a rule keeping owner of this restaurant. If you didn't order the soup the right way, he said, no soup for you. So I walk into this. It was a falafel and hummus joint and and fool. If you're familiar with fool. Oh, yeah. Love where, it. What hummus is to the chickpea, fool is to fava beans. Yeah. So they only served falafel, hummus, and fool. And you walk in and you have to say some permutation in the right order of these three things and then move aside. And I was so afraid. And these guys that were locals were just staring at me, standing at the door, waiting till my turn in line. And i that was the one moment of intimidation that I felt. I didn't fear for my safety, but I feared for my my your cred, my, my ego, my street yeah. cred, right? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. I, but I did it right. I knew the words to use. And my goodness, if you've never stepped into a, as you say, it's always a hole in the wall for a good story, a hole in the wall, hummus, fool, falafel place in some bigger city in the Middle East, you get a bowl of perfection. I want to know if you have a worst travel food story. That's a good question. Yes, I know it's a good question. So I should have thought more about this. And I, I don't know if it says something about me that maybe I suppress these. You know, I would say that I went to high school in England. My senior year of high school, I went to England. And after my dad's, my dad was a Brit, you know, and his food stories were terrible. I mean, God, you know, he, you know, he's born 1938, left to come to Canada uh, in the 60s and never went really back to England, except for maybe some very short visits and just told the horror stories about the food. And the upshot was basically everything's boiled, right? Oh, you like some boiled cabbage? And it's like, you know, here's a perfectly good piece of cabbage that has been eviscerated and, you know, cleansed of all of its flavor and vitamins and placed onto your plate. I have to say, I had pretty good food in England then. And since I've been back to London, I've had spectacular food. So, you know, this is not, your question is not, where did you go and expect to have bad food? And actually it was pretty decent. But if your question had been that, that's how I'd answered it. Here's a lousy food story. It seems to me that a lot of it can come down to service. And there was a place around the corner from us. So this is not a travel story. This is a corner that's around the corner from us on Upshur. And there was this woman who was really, really smart. She opened this, and I want to say it was it was some. Uh, this is terrible. It was some kind of Scandinavian cuisine. The restaurant's gone now. She closed it. It was there for years. It was one of the early places to come in to the kind of Parkview Petworth neighborhood. And it was it was a it was a Scandinavian cuisine. It was really interesting. She had a bunch of flavored aquavits. She was a brilliant cook. Really good cook. We went there from time to time. It wasn't a super frequent occurrence. But also, I just remember some really cool, like, buckwheat-based breakfast dishes with eggs. Like, creative chef, good cook. But she, I think, had been doing it for too long, and she was just tired. And I can understand this as a restaurant owner. She was tired of people coming in and saying, like, could you substitute the this? Could you do the that? She's like, no, you know, I do what I do. Kai was pregnant, and, you know, there was, a, there was an interdiction against soft cheeses, and so there was this really delicious piece of grilled tilapia and it was served with, I think, a risotto that had a bunch of soft cheeses in it. And I was like, is there any chance, you know, my husband's ordering this thing with these roasted potatoes that are great. Is there any chance you could just not put the risotto on my dish and just give me the potatoes instead? And the waiter got this look like, oh God, I'm being asked for a substitution. And I was like, I'm pregnant. I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to eat this. I'm sorry. But the waiter, you could just tell had the deer in headlights. And he's like, oh, I'll need to go back and ask in the kitchen. We're like, okay, this isn't a big deal. Like just, you know, the potatoes are there in the kitchen, lots of space on the plate. Went back and he's like, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't substitute the potatoes. And we're like, and he's like, I can, I can leave the risotto off. And we're like, all right. And all I can tell you is that that piece of grilled tilapia showed up on Kai's plate with nothing else on the plate. And it just looked like a big f 
index <laughs> finger. You know, it just on sitting there on the plate, it looked like the chef just saying, you know what, to hell with you and your substitution. All I will do for you is leave something off. I will not do anything else. And that was a lousy meal because the tilapia was well prepared. My potatoes were well prepared. This is a creative person who is capable of just flicking a spoon and she refused to do it. So that was that was a crappy meal. My comment will be directly in line with the spirit of your story. Well, that sounds like a giant pain in the ass. We're going to go to the final part of this interview in which I give you five fill in the blanks. Are you ready for that, Alex? I think so. Blank will be my last meal. Vegetarian lasagna. It needs to have some walnut pesto, some toasted walnut pesto, absolute necessity. And you just layer that in right on top of the noodles and then a little tomato sauce and then a little bit of cheese. But the walnut pesto adds a kind of fattiness that you don't normally get in lasagna that tastes really good. Well, you know, as they say, if you're going to bite the bullet, one of your last tastes should be walnut pesto. I cook blank to impress people. Pizza. What's on top of it? Whatever I have to hand. Olives, a little spinach, tomato sauce, tiny bit of Parmesan. And if pizza is an impressive dish, I'm going to push you a little bit. It all has to do with the crust. So what's your secret? What have you figured out? I mean, the dough that I've been fiddling with for, for you know, over a year now has some whole wheat. You know, it is two thirds, either bread flour or all purpose flour. Uh, and one third white whole wheat flour, tablespoon of salt, tablespoon of yeast, heaping tablespoon of yeast. And then, you know, what 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 I've been messing with are the rises. You know, how how long to rise? Do you need? Do you fold? And recently I've just been folding. I'll do two folds and then cut it into balls and, you know, give it a half hour, which is a technique really that you and I discussed in detail when we were down in North Carolina. Like I saw you doing that 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 half hour sit before when they were in sort of ball form. Absolutely. That's that's the, that's the, you know, I, I, I don't know if I have a secret, but if there is a secret, I like some whole wheat flour in my dough. I just think it tastes better. It's not about healthy. I think it tastes better. Yeah. It's certainly got a flavor. I I find that with, particularly with pizza, the thing that, that magical pizza chefs have that most of us mortals do not is the technique of using the wettest possible dough or the highest moisture proportion dough to create this wonderful, crispy, airy experience. And that's where I think if you get that, you've got every pizza fan in the world waiting for your product. And I think I'm, you know, I'll be honest and say, I'm not sure I've totally got it there. I think I'm close. I think I'm close, but a year of practicing every single week has only gotten me close, right? I'm not there yet. So it just tells you how, you know, this is a study, you know? Oh man, you should taste my banana bread after this year. (laughs) I cook blank to make myself feel better. Pasta. Plain pasta? What's on it? We have a thing in our house where I actually like to cook the pasta for the last minute in the tomato sauce. Standard practice. Who doesn't? Kai does not like it that way. She does like tomato sauce, but she wants to add the tomato sauce on the plate after the fact. So, you know, and we have a variety of different pasta needs in our house. Like, you know, Nico doesn't like tomato sauce. So, and I know you and I have discussed this before. I know this drives you crazy. (laughs) I hit, when it's done, I spritz it all with olive oil. Because for me, I love olive oil. I love the smell. I love the taste. I put a little olive oil on everything. I bathe in it. Right, right. Rub it into my skin. A little <laughs> olive oil. And I also often will splash it with a little bit. And here's real sacrilege. I'll splash it with a little bit of lemon juice. So it's a slightly lemony, olivey oil, salted pasta. That's the base. That is delicious. And two of the boys will eat at least a serving of that by itself. And sometimes if I'm feeling fancy, I'll throw a little lemon zest in there too, which I think kicks it up to the next level. But then I will sometimes, and here maybe is where we get into the sacrilege territory. I'll take that and I'll add some tomato sauce on top of it. Okay, that's a little bizarre, but but, but the rest sounds delicious. (laughs) Next one is, the one food I would erase from the earth is blank. Blood pudding. I just, I know it's delicious. I probably just, I wouldn't miss it. It's just that concept, you know, it's like it shows up on your plate as this like black slab. I'm like, that's blood pudding. I just even when I was a meat eater, I was not interested. 
Um, I happen to be a fan, but I totally understand where someone is dissuaded from eating it. Well, you and I have had this conversation before, but it's worth bringing up again that sometimes a dislike for a food is more conceptual than it is, you know, kind of actual. And I think, you know, you, you and I have discussed this with reference to eggs, right? Like, is it really the fact that I don't like runny eggs or do I not like the idea of runny eggs? Is it really that I don't like blood pudding or do I not like the idea of blood pudding? And the reason I'm bringing it up is because minerality is cool. Like when I can get minerality in wine or cheese, I'm like, man, I like that flavor. And it's hard to get good mineral, I think, in a lot of places. So maybe it's just a conceptual problem for me with blood pudding. The Chinese uh, make a, a substance that if you never ask the server, what is this soup? One might assume that this is a uh, darkened tofu soup. It's got the texture of tofu. It's got uh, the, the, the formation of tofu. It floats the same way as tofu. But the minute it hits your tongue, you know. It's not. It's coagulated pig's blood. And it is delicious from a, from a fan of blood pudding. That's my perspective. It is disgusting conceptually. And I totally understand where that comes from. Here's my last fill in the blank. Okay. Blank is for dinner tonight. Oh, that's easy. We, so we've been writing out our menus and this is another thing that's happened as a result of COVID is that each week we plan out the menu we're doing, um, we're doing rice noodles which will flavor with a little just garlic and amino acids, kind of substitute for for um for soy sauce, and then on the side, I'm just gonna I'm gonna flash fry some green beans and olive oil and salt, and uh, we're, we're frying some tofu, which I'll do in like a mixture of orange juice, five spice powder, and soy sauce. Are you sure it's not coagulated pig's blood? I sure as hell hope that it is coagulated soy blood. <laughs> Well, Alex, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Thanks. Professor, professor, I know that you have a lot going on. What with all of your Zooms and all of your Zoom classes and all of your Zoom meetings, you live on this platform. I do, sadly. Although this has been really fun. If, if all of my Zoom experiences could be as fun as this, I would be better off as a human. So thank you for the invitation. It's been fun. See ya. All right, be well. To all of you wonderful, intelligent listeners out there, Remember to subscribe to this show, follow me on Instagram, and find our books with your favorite seller. Those are One Pan to Rule Them All, Kiss My Casserole, How to Cook Anything in Your Dutch Oven, Chinese Street Food, and the forthcoming Off the Top of My Head, Recipes, Rants, and Ravings of an American Cook Obsessing in Barcelona. Until next time, stay saucy and eat well.